Attention all real estate investors. Whether you're a novice just looking to get started or you are a seasoned professional, you are not going to want to miss today's episode. I have invited on a powerhouse in the industry. In Central Florida, he is known as Alex Q. He is going to discuss how he got started in the industry, how he today uses creative financing to acquire properties, and how he went from fixing and flipping residential real estate to going all in with storage units. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children, 18 plus, you are tuned in to the Loan Officer Podcast with me, Dustin Nowen, and a very special guest. He is a Orlando native. He also went to the University of Central Florida. He loves the Orlando magic. He wishes one day he can catch a pass from Jalen Hurts, fly, eagle, fly. He is a household name in the Central Florida real estate community. He is my new friend. Alex Q, a.k.a. Alex Kazada, if I pronounce that appropriately. Alex, welcome to the Loan Officer Podcast. Thanks for having me. I like that open. Yeah, that's like your WWE <laughs> like entrance or your, your UFC entrance. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I'm so stoked for today because I was telling you off camera, but the, I want the audience to know this. I have been dabbling in the Central Florida real estate market now for going on five years. And when I entered into the industry and you went to any meeting, any meetup, or any message board, all anyone ever talks about is Alex Q, Alex Q, Alex Q. And I'm like, man, I got to meet this Alex Q guy. <laughs> and it's funny how recently our, our worlds actually intersected. I'm like, wait a minute. This is that same Alex Q guy people are talking about. And then I get to meet you in person. I'm like, wait a minute. I know you from the gym. I'm like, do you, do you work out at the, at the LA Fitness in Winter Park? And you were like, small world. Yeah, you used to at least. Yeah. You don't need more, right? Um, so yeah, no, I'm excited to have you on. You are a Central Florida native, correct? Born and raised. Born and raised. Have you ever lived anywhere outside of Orlando? Nope, not more than vacation. Not more than vacation. Inquiring minds want to know, how are you an Eagles fan? Uh, when I was uh, in high school playing football, I was like a big Brian Dawkins fan. Okay. That was like my go-to player. Were you a safety? I, I played safety uh, my sophomore year, but mostly linebacker. Okay. But that was, that was like my guy, that was my player. And I really didn't have a team. I didn't even know like Tampa Bay was like, that close. <laughs> my, my dad was a, a Bears fan, so okay. he, he was from Chicago. And so just always been an Eagles fan since pretty much freshman year of high school. Nice. And you are a full-time real estate investor. All, all day. All in, all day. How long have you been in the real estate investing world? Uh, did my first deal in 2011, and that's when I started educating myself too, 2011. Okay. So, so 13 years now, going on yeah. 14 years. What did you do prior to real estate? Uh, I did face to face like uh, timeshare sales, but it was like with a travel travel club. So we went to city to city, like retirement communities, set up presentations, did face to face sales. They went to a presentation for like 60 minutes. I had a conversation with them first, a little intro. They went to a presentation. When they came out, I had to ask them for pretty much 10 grand and um, did that for about two years. Uh, didn't that was my first real sales job and quickly I became the the top seller for the, my last two years and it was a great learning experience it's definitely helped me in, in my business today yeah I'm gonna circle back to that in a second but as we build out your timeline uh, was that your first career job outside of getting your degree from UCF yeah pretty much before that I worked at like a restaurant and stuff like that okay during high school and during college and I'm assuming you went to college for real estate investing right uh, fix and flip 101 was probably one of your one of the courses you took I, actually no I'm, <laughs> I went to school for finance I wanted to be a stockbroker okay and then I heard an ad on the radio how to buy houses with no money down and then went to that course bought all the courses they sold at that course went to a bunch of seminars and then just started educating myself while I was still doing uh, the face-to-face -face timeshare sales. would you consider yourself growing up like a natural born hustler like, like, did yeah. you, were you always money motivated? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Where, where did that come from? Um, I think my parents worked very hard to put me into private school where they, you know, they had to work hard to get me to private school. Uh, we weren't zoned for the best schools. And so just, I guess, seeing like all the other kids kind of like having the, the super nice houses and getting whatever they want kind of was like, well, I want whatever I want to. So like, I always was like selling candy and selling this stuff and whatever. So that way we can, you know, I can have extra money or have my own money. And uh, I just definitely was always money motivated for sure. I always love that when I'm getting to know people, especially successful people such as yourself, because what I find is we all have a backstory. Okay. And I love to like peel back the layers of onion and find that backstory. Or even when I'm hiring sales professionals, I would tell them, hey, I'm looking for your chip. Where's the chip on your shoulder? Because like, I have a similar story. Yours was, my parents worked their butt off to put me into this expensive private school. When I went to that expensive private school, I didn't necessarily relate to so many of my peers 
Um, but I wanted to, yeah. and mine was similar that I went to a, a public school, right? Shout out Lyman high school. If you're in Seminole County, Florida, and, and I went to that school still today, people are like, Oh, you went to Lyman? I'm like, Hell yeah. I went to Lyman. I'm proud of that. You yeah, know, yeah. but like I, I went there and I had friends that were spanned all parts of the socioeconomic. It was a very diverse school, but I remember, you remember the, 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 um, the store structure. Like when, when we were in high school, you'd go to structure. It was like the the version of like Express that yeah. the girls had was for guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember seeing my my structure shirt. It was a long sleeve shirt, and it was parasailing in <laughs> the Bahamas, and it was hanging out with if you're a basketball fan, Patrick Ewing and John Starks. Wow. But I wasn't hanging out with John Starks or Patrick Ewing, and I wasn't parasailing. <laughs> and I remember having that feeling that that wasn't fair. Huh. And by the way, it was one of my dear friends had, you know how girls always steal guys' clothes? Yeah, she had taken that and she had taken it with her on vacation and she was wearing it. And I was like, that, that ain't fair, right? That's funny. But th it's that chip that, that lasted with me that I said the same thing that probably you said. Hey, look, I came from an awesome family, two parents that worked really hard to provide for me and my sister, but I want to be going to Atlantis. I want to go to the Bahamas. Huh. And I made sure that whatever I, I did in life, I was gonna put myself in a situation where I could succeed. You did the same thing. And uh, you know, quite quite honestly, probably at a much higher level than I'd be able to, to achieve. So now I have someone to chase because you're the person I can chase, <laughs> especially when it comes to real estate investing. Okay, so what I also heard that I think is great for the audience to know, you learned how to sell. You yep. learned how to sell timeshares-ish. Yep. Yeah, Tatcher ish is like they had access to travel clubs and cruises and whatnot. But yeah, it was definitely a lot of learning curve. I, I learned pretty much from my two guys who were my managers, one I'm business partners with today still, and uh, just face to face sales. They gave me a lot of books to read. It was really like just regurgitating a lot of things they said and just under, like every morning they did sales training, the same thing we do for our team today. Um, and but it was real deal sales face to face. You only had like an hour, you know, so it was. It was good. It was yeah, and intensive. obviously it's a it's a skill set that once you learn it, you can only build upon it, and it's yeah. something that no one will take away from you. I have, um, in fact, he and I are getting ready to go to the Bahamas tomorrow to go fishing. But one of my oh, closest nice. friends, shout out to Rob, he was like guest number one on the show. Nice. And Rob's a very successful financial advisor. So like, if you and your company ever need to like roll out four hundred one k, he's your dude, right? That's what he does for a living. But I remember Rob was trying to break into the mortgage industry because he was a couple years after me in school. He was on the six year plan. I was on the four year plan <laughs> type thing. And he was like, oh, Dio, help me break into the mortgage industry. And I was like, hey, I'll try, but you don't have sales experience. Yeah. Like I had sales experience. I went and sold TV advertising out of college and Rob didn't have it. And he still today tells me, dude, thank you so much for that advice you gave me. Oh. I went and obtained sales experience. He went and sold timeshares. Nice. He sold yeah. timeshares for Marriott, did it for two years. Like you did it successfully after he had sales. Now, all of a sudden the Morgan Stanley's and the Merrill Lynch's would be willing to hire him to come in as a financial advisor and go through their three-year training program. But without sales experience, yep. they wouldn't. Yeah. So you gain sales experience. I think that's great for anyone to know. I know we're doing a whole entire episode on real estate investing. I promise you I'm going to get there. And by the way, y'all, there's a whole entire um, playlist on YouTube. That's called the real estate investors playlist. So if you like content like this, obviously start with this episode, but then work your way back and have fun with it. Um, and later in the show, Alex is probably going to shout out a coaching program that you can be a part of um, and potentially some opportunities to JV joint venture deals with he and his team. So we're definitely going to get there, but I want, I want this to be a bit of a learning moment. So they get to know you, but they have to learn how to be more like you and they can pick apart the bits and pieces that, that works best for them. My question is when you were, graduating degree in finance, when you were going to um, go out four days a week on the road, hardcore sales, successful, right? You're number one, making really good money, 22, 23 wow. years old. But you mentioned buying courses in real estate investing. Were you doing that while you're also obtaining your degree? Were you doing that while you're also selling timeshare? Or does that did that happen after the fact? It happened during when I had the, the timeshare job uh, after college. Um, in college, I did have a, a, some real estate classes, but I, it was more, it was a finance degree and I, I was always interested in real estate, but just hearing that ad on the radio, it was like, I was literally saving money to buy my own house and I had a good chunk of change sitting around. And that's when like the, the mortgage industry crashed. And then I was just like, I'm gonna start. I saw that ad and I was like, I'm gonna go to this event. It was like 500 bucks. Went to that. There's a bunch of people talking about how there's the next event that's like a three-day event. 
I bought the that course was like three grand, and then there was like a pitch fest. Like everybody was selling like this short sale thing and this and this and that. I bought like everybody's stuff and then just kind of educated myself for like a good amount of time before I actually took action. Um, I'm like a good like student and I was just like really educating myself. And because I was out of town four days a week, it was a little tough to like take action on it until that's why I was like, I just got to quit and go all in because I can't do this with being in town like Monday to through Wednesday. Wow. Know? I love that. That whole all in aspect. I mean, that's a Grant Cardone's book obsessed. Like you sounds like you became obsessed. Then you went all in, you bet on yourself recognizing that, hey, look, at the end of the day, I guess if worst came to worst, you can go back and yeah. sling those timeshares yeah. on on those you know four-day <laughs> sales trips that you were going on, yeah. or you could bet on yourself. Sounds like you saved a little bit of money, and um, I love and appreciate, and I think that's something for the audience to take away. Sometimes if you wanna achieve the highest levels of success, you're gonna have to go all in, yeah. understanding there might not be a safety net underneath. You know, The safety net is you figuring out what to do sure. if and when you hit rock bottom. Curious, did you ever come to a point in your career where you felt like you hit rock bottom? Um, I got close. There's like times in my real estate career where um, I worked for somebody else. I, I started doing my own deals and then only did a couple, but I was like, I'm missing something in my business. And I actually ended up working for somebody else for a couple of years and like ran their wholesale business while they did rehabs and new builds. And then I ventured off on my own with my brother. He was 18 and we started doing our own our own thing. And there was definitely a point in time where I can, in May, of I forget what year, but like, I was like, man, I, I don't have enough money for like marketing or bills of like these deals don't close. Yeah. And the thing with these kind of deals, like the wholesale deals, you know, you're dealing with people with problem properties or a lot of problems themselves. So foreclosures and probates and all the issues. So you could be like, Hey, I'm going to make a hundred grand this month, but then this deal falls out because of title issues. This deal gets delayed because of probate. So sometimes it, like the cat, you have cash flow crunches. And there was definitely a time where I was like, man, this is, I don't know what's, what's going to happen here, but uh, it actually got me back to doing what got me there in the first place, which was like speaking my life into existence, like like affirmations, like doing those things that I started doing when I was doing the timeshare stuff. Okay. Uh, when like I got certain books put uh, put in front of me where I I they the new guy would come in for the timeshare place and they'd be like train this guy they're like what are you doing that's that's different and I'd be like hey every morning I wake up and I'm like looking in the mirror in the hotel room, like sniffing eucalyptus oil out of my hands, being like, I'm going to get the best clients today. I'm going to get people who love to travel. I'm going to get people who are, who are ready to, to, to make moves. And I literally like, just like spoken to existence, yeah, having good you customers. manifested it. Almost. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. And so like, I, that's like been a whole part of my life. Everything I have in my life right now, I've like literally wrote down prior and, and read it every day into existence. You still do it. I still do it now. Yeah. Do you journal? I do not journal. No. Okay. Do you meditate? I do not meditate now. Meditation is something that I, I I think I could maybe fuck with a little bit, <laughs> but I'm like not there yet. Like yeah. you know, there hasn't been enough changes in my life or enough pain in my life where I'm like, I need to find meditation. Yeah. Same thing goes for journaling, although I love to write. So I'm always curious. And I love like I love this aspect of what I get to do with with being a podcast host is I love getting to know the people, but really it's the story because we all have a story. Yeah. Um so was there ever a part in your story where well not how about this? I'm gonna rephrase it. How long in your story before you felt like you made it? Like, was it one year? Was it five years? Cause you know, you shared, Hey, look, there was a time may of some year. We can't remember if it was 13 or 15 yeah. where you were like, Hey, if these two deals don't close, I, I can't pay marketing and, and payroll. Something has to give. Um, so that was a great answer. And I appreciate you sharing that. But how long, how long did you go before you felt like you quote unquote made it? Man, I, I uh, it's hard because like there's always, I've always felt like I I've, I've done very well for myself, even like when I was at the timeshare place, like I was making good money compared to like some people I knew or friends, and but it's like getting yourselves in bigger circles where it's like even right now I'm like, there's so much more I need to accomplish or want to do and whatnot. So I think when I actually like went full cycle on like three self storage deals and sold those and actually got like a seven figure check, like I think that was like my, which was only last year where I really felt like I accomplished something really big and that was like a, a game changer for me. But uh, there's so much still to, to do and uh, I can achieve a lot more. So it's getting in those circles with people who are so much above you that like they kind of keep pushing you forward. Yeah. So think about this. So you're 13 years into it. 
but you finally had that seven figure deal. Yeah. Like I'm sure there's years that your revenue and potentially even your net revenue was, was well above seven figures, but one transaction. Oh. So that was a self storage unit that you purchased. And by self storage, that's like, um, I go and dump off my, my boat, my old trailer, my old furniture, yeah. and I pay you a couple hundred bucks a month to put my stuff in there. I throw a padlock on it, right? That's yep. self storage. How many units was that self storage? So that was actually three properties. Um, we owned all of them less than two years and I had partners, financial partners um, who invested with us and we packaged them together and sold three of the, the, the facilities we had. At that point in time, we had seven or eight and we sold three of them together. Uh, two were very close to each other and then the other one was not too far away and just really good add value opportunities for us. One of them was my first deal ever and for self storage and just had a good hit, hit it at the right time. And we had enough ad value where we doubled the, the value of each property in less than two years. Yeah. And for those that don't know, ad value is essentially, and here's what I've learned in my short little five years of being a minority owner in a real estate investment company is, you know, the goal is to buy it right. Yep. Right. That's, that's it. We make our money when we buy, buy these properties, but ad value is, is you improved the 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 property in some manner which allowed you to raise the rents that yep. you were collecting at which point it it increased the cap rate increased the cash flow increased the 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 home the the property's overall yep. value yep. right so if it was an apartment complex same exact thing you would buy the apartment complex you would try to make the apartment complex more beautiful more attractive maybe even the units themselves more modern that adds value by the way it's cost cuz that's rehab yep. money but all of a sudden you can start increasing rents yep. as you increase rents, you increase your cap rate, which increases the cash flow, which at one point then would increase the home's value or at this point, the property yep. value. Yep. And then you're saying you're able to do that. You held it for a couple of years and then all of a sudden you sold it for much more than what you had bought it for. Yes. No, that's fantastic. Right. And that was took you 13 years to get there. <laughs> right. And, and I think you answered my question the way that I anticipated a guy like you to answer it which is, dude, I still don't feel like I made it. Like yeah. I'm 13 years into this. Yes, I just cashed a seven figure check, but I still haven't figured out, you know, because I'm not at Grant Cardone's level or yeah. whoever else it is that you're currently chasing. For sure. So that's what's next for you the next 13 years. What does that look like for you? Yeah, uh, my goal was to buy like $50 million. So in 2023, we sold about $10 million of assets, but we bought $10 million of assets. Okay. We had a $50 million portfolio. Uh, we And so this year, my goal was to buy $50 million uh, of Real estate. Yep. Uh, after probably the end of this summer, we'll have acquired maybe like 15, 18 million. Um, but and are these all residential properties or some multifamily? Or are you going all in on self storage? Self storage. So all in and self storage, but we still have our. So after I did a re residential, I got into residential first, wholesaling mostly, and so we still have the wholesale business, and we'll probably have it forever because it's a source of income and source of deals. And so my brother runs the day to day of my wholesale business. And so from there we pick up properties. So we still buy maybe one to two properties a month, only creative finance deals. And so we bought several million dollars worth of houses already. And then self storage wise, we have three under contract right now, potentially another fourth one uh, this week. And so that's all storage and that's what I focus on. And then my brother runs the day of the, the single family, but the 18 million ish would be for a single family and uh, self storage together. Okay. How many, um, like Metro areas are you operating in? Are you only in central Florida? Or are you now going outside of the state of Florida? So for wholesale, we've, we're outside of the state of Florida. We were at a one point in time before the kind of correction in the market right now uh, and interest rates went up, we were nationwide wholesaling. So we were, wow, no yeah, way. Yeah. So we, we also are strategically partnered with the call center in South America. So we had uh, the ability to like go out fast to any other market that was a good market. But when, with, without, uh, with the interest rates going higher, it's all about really knowing your buyers and our best buyers were in Florida and North Carolina. So that's mainly where we focus now in wholesaling. So we pulled back okay. on our wholesale business for self storage. My first seven, eight deals were in Florida. But then a couple of marketing campaigns, I was, it was crickets. So I was like, I'm, I'm to continue growing my self storage business. I need to kind of go outside of Florida. So then we got a next deal at Texas, uh, Georgia, Illinois, and we're buying one in PA, Michigan next week, two weeks. Is so that because growing. you learned amongst you know, the past decade now, decade and a half, that at the end of the day, once you learn how to find the property, that's marketing. Yep. And once you learn how to underwrite the property, it matters less whether it's in, in Chattanooga, Jacksonville, 
or San Antonio? Yeah, it, it does. It, you w- definitely want to have the the right size to manage them appropriately because every you know owner that's most of the times we buy in these uh, self storage facilities with like mom and pop owners who like run the facility and operate the facility. And if they're in Michigan or Illinois or wherever it is, and it's only a certain size. Well, their expenses levels are much lower because they're cutting the grass, they're managing it, they don't have employees, those things like that. So they're like, hey, my property's worth this based on my expenses, my income, and my net operating income. But for me, I have to hire somebody to cut the grass. I have to hire somebody to be at the property and fix things. So my expenses are higher, so the value that I can give you is much less. So you got to plug that in, and it's the same you know, for having someone to cut the grass or be at the property to maintain it, it's the same almost cost for a 20,000 square foot facility and a 40,000 square foot facility or a 10 or, you know, 50, maybe gets a little bit higher. You need like a full, full time person, but that same cost can get spread out on a larger facility where on a smaller facility, it impacts your, your net operating income a lot more. Okay. So you really want to buy a bigger property when you're going out of state. Um, no, that's phenomenal insight. I want to maybe backtrack a little bit. Yep. And I'm going to backtrack more for, you know, we I teased in the opener, you know, whether you're a novice or, you know, whether you're a seasoned professional. A seasoned professional is going to hear what you just said, and they're going to be like, oh, got it, got it, got it. Love hearing that. Thank you so much. You're probably, you know, edifying something I already know. But to the novice, I'm going to go back to Alex Q in 2020, 11, or in 2011. Um, but like, you mentioned wholesale, you mentioned, you mentioned fix and flip. Um, what does wholesale mean to you? Because right now your business at, at this juncture is your brother's running a very successful wholesale business. And if I heard you correctly, you all, I say cherry pick, you cherry pick two of the properties, not the wholesale. And at which point you take them down, which means you acquire them, you own them, yep. but only if you're able to get creative financing on it. So we're going to want to unpack creative financing. But let's first, just very shortly, in, in layperson terms, what does it mean to wholesale a property? Yep. So like almost every business, there's a wholesale company. So if you're buying direct, so we go direct to owner, we're getting a discounted property as much as possible. And it's because they have either a problem situation or a problem property. So we're coming to them saying, hey, we can solve your problem. Give us the lowest price we can get do through negotiations. So we get a property for a hundred grand. You're a rehab flipper. You want to buy these properties. You're busy, you know, doing the rehab, you know, turning these properties. You don't have time to do marketing and find these deals and opportunities all the time. So we come to you and I'm like, Hey, Dio, I got this deal. It's right in your backyard, similar to what you have bought before. I got it for you for 120. You're like, Oh, perfect. I can put 30 grand into it. Sell for 220. Perfect deal for me. So I sell you my, essentially my contract for 20 grand profit. Yep. yep. So a true wholesaler, no yep. different than someone kids today are drop shipping. Yeah. Right. They're running ads on Facebook. Someone's buying it, but they're, but they don't really have inventory. So then when you place the order, then the drop shipper places the order yep. with China, China then ships it directly to their house and they're picking up a profit margin. Yep. Walmart purchases their products from Procter and Gamble at a wholesale price. Yep. They then put them in the shelves, let us come to their store. They sell it to us at a marked up price. Exactly. So you as a real estate investor, for those of, for those that are tuning in and they're interested in maybe becoming the next Alex Q. Yeah. Wholesaling is a way to operate a business where you go out and market yourself. You, you get home sellers to call you because they're interested in selling their property that probably has problems. Yep but you're going to be able to get it at a discount. So you can, the term we use is lock it up, right? Get it under contract. But then that's the first part. Yeah. Maybe the hardest part, maybe not. Maybe they're both equally hard. I'll let you tell me what your experience are. Cause then you have to go out and find someone who wants to buy this home, but for a slightly marked up price. In your example, you put it under contract for a hundred. You then assigned that contract to me. Let's say I'm Dio, the fix and flip king of, of Sanford, Florida, and I would love to buy that property for 120. Alex did the hard part. He found it, which is the hard part. I would love to buy it for 120. I'm going to put 50 grand into it. I'm going to sell it for 250. I'm going to make my profit. Yep. You get paid and you're happy. And you did what you were really good at, which is marketing and finding properties and getting them locked up. I didn't have to do what I wasn't good at, which was find properties. Yep. Um, but then I, I now get to do what I'm good at, which is buy a property, add value, fix it flip, and then yep. flip it for a profit, right? That's essentially wholesaling 101. Yep. 
100. Beautiful. How did you choose to wholesale? Why do you not fix and flip? Uh, we actually do fix and flip. Okay. Um, and I, I for 2011 to 2017, roughly, like we, uh, 2016, we just wholesaled. Okay, that's all you everything. did. Yeah, and I regret it because I wish I held back some a lot of properties back then. Pine Hills, if you're familiar with Orlando, you buying properties for 30, 50 grand. I was wholesaling those. Now you can barely touch anything under 200. And so it's a, you know, it's all about timing. But um, for many years, I just wholesaled everything I could. So you started as a wholesaler. That's how 100%. you entered the industry. That's how you learned it. Yep. Okay, so that makes sense that yep. that's what you still do today. Yep. And and from there, you know, we started buying buying and holding with creative financing, doing some fix and flips with private money or hard money loans. And it was, it's, it's very good. It's a different business. They're all different businesses. But wholesaling I started with because I didn't have money. So a lot of, like anybody out there today, most people... Wholesaling is a full-time job. Like it, you know, people want to quit their job and do wholesaling, be ready for a full-time job. It's like yeah. nonstop. It's very competitive. You have to be on it all the time. And so it's a lot of work where a lot of times I tell people, if you have a good job and you like your job and you make good money, I, I would go first and you want to get into real estate and maybe quit your job. I would start doing something like a commercial, commercial buying commercial properties or fix and flip because you can do it kind of more passively. Okay. Because unless you're going to go out there and actually, you know, put swing up a drywall, the hammer, and yeah. swing the hammer, you know, you can hire those things out and then, you know, make those big checks while you're still working and just having to manage your, your contractors or your employees. So what I hear is wholesale is a grind, grind, but wholesale is a great way for someone to enter if they are short capital yes. because you need an advertising budget. Obviously you need to be trained, yeah. right? You need to learn how to value property, how to buy it right. The hardest part I will tell you from experience is actually that wholesale list, right? It's having the list of the reputable buyers who would want to buy a property from you. Uh, but no one teaches you that, at least in any course I took, they teach me how to, how to go out and find the property, how to underwrite the property, how to negotiate the property. Yeah. But then once you have the property locked up, you know, that wholesale list is, is what makes someone like you uber successful. And it, it's what everyone else in the market is chasing oh. that you'd probably never give up, which is your wholesale list. Cause that's your Holy grail. Yeah. We have like one of the best buyers list in central Florida. Like people send us deals all the time j doing JVs, like new wholesalers come in, they find a deal. They can't find a buyer. The problem is there's so many new wholesalers out there that you might be a buyer and you're getting sent emails, but you're like, I don't know this person or like their credibility. So like you just probably pass it. And a lot of these people don't even get your email. They'll scrape it from a list or somewhere else. So you're like, I don't even know who these people are. So you're not even going to look at it. But if we have a relationship because you bought deals for me over many years, and I send you that same deal, they already sent you, you'll buy it from me because you know me and we have a relationship. So we've, for 12, 13 years, built a, a very buy, uh, great buyers list in Central Florida and other areas too, or people send us their deals and we sell them literally like in hours. So check this out, ding, 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 light bulb moment just went off for that, that novice who's tuning in. Okay, you're like, I would love to get into real estate investing. I love Alex's story. How can I be the next Alex? Even if you're in Knoxville or you're in Des Moines or anywhere else not called Central Florida. And you can get into real estate with limited money if you can at least learn the, the craft of how do I market and find these properties, then how do I underwrite them? How do I get them locked up? But then there's, this is the, the light bulb moment that you said so passively, but I'm like, oh my gosh, no, that's genius. People need to understand this. There's an Alex Q in just about every market. For sure. So when you find that property, maybe you thought you're gonna make 20,000, but you only make 20,000 on that, on that when you find someone willing to buy it. And maybe you don't have the clout, you don't have the, uh, respect of, of peers that someone like Alex does, you can joint venture with Alex and say, hey, Alex, I've locked up this property. It's locked up at this price. Yeah. Can you help me gain access to this buyer list? Would you put your reputation on it? And you're like, sure for a fee, yeah, right? Like we're going to sit down and we're going to negotiate. I want a piece of the action, but I'm going to help you sell it because you only realize that gain if you actually sell the contract or sell the home. Yep. So that is an easy way for, in my opinion, in my experience, someone to get into this industry where they use partnerships, yep. even if it's a one-off partnership in order to facilitate until they can start maybe gaining a little bit of that, um, that uh, respect or clout within their industry to where they start building on their own, their own list. Yeah, 100%. So you started as a, as a wholesaler, did not know that. Let's get into creative financing. So what do you mean when you say you purchase two properties a month that are residential properties? I'm assuming you and your brother and your company are keeping these as long-term rentals yep. because that's how you really amass wealth, 
right? You make money by fixing and flipping. You make money by wholesaling. I haven't figured out a, a way to become wealthy by wholesaling and fixing and flipping. Yeah. I, I gain wealth by buying properties, holding properties yep. and, and getting them rented out. And you all are, your business model is you're going to wholesale as much as you can, but you're going to try to buy two properties a month using creative financing. What does that look like? So uh, there's two kind of ways that are like most people should be most familiar with, which is straight seller financing, where essentially like same thing with houses or commercial. So I'm going to give you the example of commercial because it's ongoing right now. So I'm buying a self storage facility. I'll make the numbers even $2 million self storage facility. Okay. And the seller has no debt. So instead of me going to a bank and get debt, because banks right now are six, yeah, well, a, seven, five, seven percent yeah, interest. Yeah, well, a good luck qualifying, and then B, once you qualify, yeah, you're paying seven, eight percent. Yep, yep. And so instead of paying those high rates, um, I can potentially, you know, because of those high rates, a lot of even if you're going to live in the house, you can only cert, afford a certain payment. Mm -hmm. So that lowers your price of what you can afford. Same thing with self storage or, or buying a single family house. When I'm buying a property from a seller and they want a certain price. Well, that interest rate from the bank won't allow me to pay that price because I can't cover the debt with the income it produces. So for me, we can say, hey, I can pay your price if you give me my terms. And my terms are instead of putting 30, 35% that the bank would require me to put down, I'll put 20%. So you're going to give them 400 grand instead of giving them 700 grand. Yep. Okay. And then instead of paying six and a half, seven, eight percent, I'll pay 5%. Okay. Or 3%, yeah. 2%, whatever I can negotiate. And so we've negotiated great deals at even 0% interest, especially on single family. We have several 0% interest loans. And then we've also negotiated, you know, long, uh, you know, 40 year mortgage ones to lower the payment where they wanted like a 4 or 5% interest. But we extended the amortization period so that way we had a smaller payment. That way we can cash flow more on that property. And ultimately, you're not going to have that debt for 40 years. You're probably going to have the property sold, pay it off, or refinanced within probably, I'm guessing, three to five. Yeah. But in order for you to give the seller the interest rate that they wanted, then you negotiated, hey, instead of us factoring this interest rate over a 30-year term, let's do a 40-year term. Yep. Um, and it makes sense for you. Yep. And I've, I've seen it done on residential the 0% interest when it comes to creative finance. And I love this. It was the seller. I'm going to use it again, whole round numbers. The seller was hell bent. They were not going to come off of 300 grand. 300 grand is what they wanted. The investor was like, I've underwritten this. It only makes sense at 280, yeah. but that 20 grand was going to be a sticking point of the transaction. Not, not going well, it's all numbers. Yep. And the investor's like, wait a minute, whether I pay 280, and I have to put X down and pay a higher interest rate or I give them the full 300, but maybe it's a 0% interest rate. I'm looking for cash flow, Yep. and I'm going to hold this property long enough that that 20 grand, whether I, I paid an interest over time or whether I pay it today up front, it's still 20 grand, but the cash flow is better. Yep. And so the first part is finding a seller who owns the home free and clear, owns the property because we're talking self storage as well. Yep. And, and you're able to negotiate with them to hold the note exactly. and potentially at way better terms. Yep. So that's what you look to do because you've had success with it. Awesome. And then the other way uh, we buy a lot of properties, mostly houses, not commercial, is by uh, doing what's called subject to. So we buy a property. A little pace, huh? <laughs> yeah. And so we do a lot of those where essentially we just purchased one. I was in Papano Beach. Uh, we're making a, a, a short-term rental and um, an Airbnb. And essentially we bought that property with I think the debt was like 2.75% interest. This person uh, wants to sell their house. They're moving. We have low debt. They wanted their certain price, but the price did not, you know, they didn't sell the house for whatever reason on the market. Now they come to us. We can pay their price by taking over their mortgage, giving them the 50 grand in equity that okay. they wanted down. We took over the payments. Now we have a low payment with low interest, which allows us, you know, every time we make a uh, payment to the mortgage, a lot more of it goes towards principal than interest because of the low interest rate. And uh, we got a good property that we'll be able to cash flow after we renovate it, which we did, and it's now on the market. But um, that's the other way we buy property. So we're taking over their payments. So essentially, their mortgage stays in place. The deed transfers over to us, and we just make payments on behalf of them every single month until we eventually sell it or pay it off in full. So this is probably like 
a conversation for you and I to have a couple of beers. I don't know if you drink beer, but we have beers <laughs> over this one because you know, in my, my day job, right. My day job is, is helping run a mortgage company. Yeah. And that's what I've been doing for the past 20 years. Well, 20 years ago, I was a young, hungry, scared, lost mortgage loan originator trying to figure life out. Right. Wife's pregnant with our first kid, just bought our first house. And I was doing manual labor on the weekends just to like put food on the table yeah. because I went into a hundred percent commission sales job. Right. I had to build out my book of business, but nonetheless, the past 10 years, most of what I do is, is help run a mortgage company. It's more on the sales and marketing and business development onboard, off board standpoint. So as a mortgage lender, it's always baffled me how real estate investors, which look, I've shared, I dabble in that world too. Yeah. How are we as real estate investors getting away with the sub two subject to creative financing? where essentially, if I understand this correctly, you as Alex Q LLC are taking over a property. The, 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 the seller no longer has ownership interest, but you never satisfied the lien, which is the mortgage. Yep. And now you all are making payments to Wells Fargo, but you're not you know, Joe Smith. Yep. You're Alex Q LLC, but you're making Joe Smith's mortgage payment. Yep. So two questions. How do investors protect themselves against maybe a lender not liking that? And again, I'm, I've never worked compliance. I'm not an attorney. Usually I'm the guy that's like making the compliance people and the attorney scared and worried. They're like, what's he going to say? What's he going to do? <laughs> Is this going to put us in jeopardy? Um, so my, my first question on this, because I love the strategy and I know there's, there's hundreds of thousands of investors that are either doing it or trying to, yeah. trying to do it. But I've always wondered as a lender, a, the person who actually owns that note, do they know about it? What happens if they find out? And then B, how do you protect Joe Smith, the seller, against maybe you and your company not making the mortgage payment anymore? Because I'm pretty confident when I pull their credit, I'm going to see that mortgage. And if you miss a payment, you're going to trash their credit rating. Yep. So can you walk me through that? And again, as quick as we can, because this would probably yeah. be like Alex and Dio go out for beers and... And, and we, we have a nice debate, but I'm just curious. Yeah, you can have like a two hour conversation on this, yeah. but essentially the most important thing is you have proper, you set up the payments correctly where you're making payments and you don't miss payments. So we always, you know, set up on auto payment or use a servicer to make sure that the payments get paid every single time. Is that servicer going to be a, what you use to protect Joe Smith from, from yeah, missing a it, payment? It doesn't necessarily protect them from us because you could still miss a payment even with a servicer. If okay. you have money in the bank account, they can't draw any money from yeah, there. Makes sense. Then it doesn't pay. But essentially what the servicer can do also is email them a notification every single month. When I first started and I, I before I knew of servicers, I'd get the online account for the for the seller. I'd um, met, turn on automatic payments with my bank account and then get the, have them still have the login access so they can go in any time and see that I'm making payments. Uh, you could send them also payment receipts all the time and just keep them aware. Um, but the, you for the bank side, they don't really care who's making the payments. Like if you, you retire your parents and you're making payments from your bank account instead of their bank account, they're not checking. They're, they got the money, they're processing the payment, everything's good. Correct. But do they care about whose name is on the deed? They're not really looking for it. Okay. So the only times that I've heard people kind of get the do on sale clause called on them, it's really small banks where you use a little local community bank. They don't have that many loans. They self-service the loans. Now they're like, oh, who's, who's this guy making the payments for Susie Smith? Then that can come up and it has come up. I've, I've paced us told stories about that and other people as well. For me, I haven't, you know, bought in any little small towns like that from little local banks. So God forbid, I haven't got that happen to me, but there is what's called a do on sale clause in every mortgage that says if there's a transfer of title, the mortgage company has the right, not the obligation to uh, request uh, the sale of the property, the, the payoff of the property. Yep. And so since, um, but if you're paying, most banks are not in the business of taking back properties. You know, now it might be a little bit different because interest rates are much lower. So if there's a big loan and they were able to catch it, you know, and you got a two, 3% loan interest are, is at six, seven, eight. I think there's a little bit more, you should be a little bit more cautious of that, especially when you're working, if you find a, uh, opportunity with a lender and it is local, a small bank, Yeah, I'd be wary of it and I wouldn't do it. Those big banks, Mr. Cooper and all those, they're, 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 
the people who are looking at those, those compliance agents, are probably in India or somewhere yeah. else, and they're not really paying attention to well, it. Well, the best part, you said, Mr. Cooper, they're not even a bank. They're just a servicer. Yeah. Like, literally, so much of the U.S. mortgage industry is serviced yep. by non-banks. Yep. Um, but I love what you said, because you're a full disclosure there, Alex, and I appreciate that, because it's like, hey, look, in a perfect, perfect world, you do seller financing. However, seller financing is not available. You can look at sub two, and sub two is a way for you to um, agree with the seller to take over their payment and start making payments. There's going to be some interaction with the seller because ultimately the seller's taxes may go up. The seller's homeowner's insurance may go up. Their HOA dues may go up. And somehow you need to be notified of, of those changes so you can make your payments appropriately. Yep. And there is a, a slight variation or a slight risk that you're going to assume as the investor who is acquiring the property using a sub two that, hey, look, most mortgages that that seller has, it's a legal document that attaches a note to a property. Most people think they pay a mortgage. I'm like, no, actually you pay a note. Yeah. The mortgage is the legal document that's attaching your promise to repay to the collateral, which is the property. So that mortgage, which is a legal document inside of it, if you read it, more times than not, somewhere in there, I don't read those things. Like, I can't change the verbiage yeah. in a mortgage. So I'm like, why in the hell am I going to read it? Yeah. I always love it when a borrower sits down and they want to read everything. I'm like, well, what's going to happen? You're not going to buy the house? Yeah. Because my company's not going to change a word of that document. Yeah. But anyhow, if you actually read it, it says things like, hey, no meth labs, no terrorist activity. Uh, please pay. If you don't pay, we're going to take the home from you. But it also says that at any time, if you violate one of these 17 uh, uh, covenants. Yeah. Covenants. Or I was thinking more like paragraphs <laughs> that we can call the note due. Yeah. Like, Hey, we're gonna call it due. You have 30 days to pay us all the money that's owed. And if that were to happen, because they just saw that it's not Joe Smith who has the deed in his name, it's as Alex Q LLC, then Alex Q LLC, look, buyer beware. You're going to have to have a contingency plan or a backup plan oh. so that you can maybe scramble and go to maybe um, cap source, yeah. right? Shout out to, to, to John over yeah. at cap source and, and say, John, man, can you bail me out? I'm, I'm getting a sub two. It hasn't happened to you yet, yep. but it is something that happens. And I, and this is my last part I'll share with the audience that's tuning in. There's actually now an insurance yeah. that when you're buying a property sub two, you can also, if you want, you can purchase an insurance policy where there's a company, assuming they're solvent, by the way, but there's a company out there or companies that say, hey, if your property gets the, um, the notification, they'll, they'll help you bridge whatever, it, whatever loss or whatever financing you have to now incur. Yep. So cool, Th those are two ways to do creative financing. Let's do this so we can find a way to put a big bow on this because like, I love this, you and I could do this for hours yeah. and maybe we should make this like some kind of a quarterly thing that we do. Oh, cool. Um, I want to kind of pepper you with some, some questions, right? And the last question is how do people find more of you? How do people learn from you? How can people JV with you? And more importantly, you have a coaching community, just like, Hey, loan officers, we have a coaching community. Alex for real estate investors has a coaching community and there's no one better that I know of that, that you, that you wouldn't want to learn from. So before we get into that, um, what is something that was maybe not talk to you early in life that you figured out the hard way because so much of this show is the shit they don't teach us in school that now that you're a parent, right? You have children. Yeah. What's you're going to make sure that they learn it. Um, I, I think one thing that I learned as a, a business owner with employees is like better leadership is like having people not solving problems for, for them, but like having them come up with their own solutions. So the same thing, that you should do with actually with your kids instead of like, and I, I'm a, I do it too. It was like my daughter struggling with something. I just do it for her mm -hmm. instead of like having her learn how to do it or come up with solutions to solve her own problems. And that's the same way you got to treat employees because if you fix everything for them, they don't learn and they don't grow. And so that's definitely something I learned, you know, recently, uh, more recently. And it's, uh, one of my mentors at a, at a mastermind I'm in, he, he said, uh, you know, he puts a clipboard out uh, with like a, hanger outside his house, outside his door. And everybody has to come to him. If they have a problem, they have to write the problem and then three solutions. And then by the time he, they get to the third one, they're like, Oh yeah, th there it is. And they yeah. solve their own problem. So bothering him all the time. Yes. I, I love that. Alex, by the way, we're doing this for four years, probably every seventh episode we have guests on. It's funny. I just went through a, 
a massive run of phenomenal guests with, with you capstoning that, that phenomenal run. And a lot of that happened because I only record in person nice. and I was out in Vegas at a big, a big mastermind event where I had a chance to speak as a keynote speaker. But when I was there, I'm like, let me take advantage yeah. of Smart. the other speakers, right? Cause I had the number one loan officer in America. The guy's name is Sean. He's uh, up in the Boston market. So I, I'm like, this is the first time Sean and I are in the same, same town at the same time. Let's have him on the show. I had this powerhouse. Like this lady is a beast. Her name is Shayla Gifford, but she's in Reno, Nevada. So we had Re we had Shayla on, and then one of my favorite new books. You may know of it. Um, it's exactly what to say by Phil M. Jones. It's really big with sales communities and real estate communities. But Phil was actually the the keynote speaker. Nice. So I was like, well, crap. Let me have Phil on. Yeah. So we normally don't have guests on, but but when I do, I ask them that same question, and usually it dates back to like something with personal finance or something with you know, um, like a, 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 a personal development, yours was leadership. Like you're like, oh, I wish I learned earlier on that to be an effective leader, I don't need to give the answer, but I need to promote an environment where, where they're encouraged and empowered to figure out the answer on their own. And I can be a collaborator, yeah. but I can't be doing it for them because if I do, they'll never learn. Um, love that. And by the way, I share in that um, where I've failed so many times as a leader, Likewise. it's just easier to do it for him. Yeah. Like, let me just do it for you. Yeah. But instead, uh, that's not good for overall business growth. All right. So that was question number one. Question number two, looking back on your career, what was the biggest mistake you made that you're grateful that you made? Um, I, I guess like a lot of times people ask me like, what's my biggest regret? And so I guess when I was doing timeshare in the top seller, I wish the event I went to wasn't about houses. That first event, it was about commercial real estate. And I went bigger, faster. Because I tell people now, like like I said earlier, if you have a good job and you make good money and you like it, go do something bigger first because it's quicker to escape. I did wholesaling, which was very good. I'm glad I did it and went that path. I, I learned a lot and we still have that, that company that runs and it's like kind of like more my cash flow. but. If I went back, I would have gone bigger faster and I would have just went into a different asset class up front. So if I had that opportunity, that's what I would I, have done. I love that um, because I was in the same boat. And all I learned is that the principles for residential real estate and the principles for commercial real estate are the same exact principles. Yeah. The only difference is we're adding zeros and, move, and, and adding commas. Yeah. But that also means I'm adding zeros and commas on the net profit. Um, exactly. so yeah, I, I love that one. All right. And then, uh, my third question is where do you see the future of real estate investing? Um, I think, um, it is more important than ever to own property with the way the directions country is going, the world's going with AI, probably AI taking over a lot of jobs and opportunities. And the only people who are going to continue to have opportunities are people who own things. And so you want to own the buildings, the assets. And so I think it's going to be more big companies like private equity companies buying up things as you see, like they're gobbling up a single family houses even still now. Um, so you got to get your foot in the door to be one of those owners because it's going to be a renter nation. It's going to be, you know, a lot of big companies, conglomerates buying up everything. So you should get your foot in the door to own some of these assets. So you're not left behind. And, I think creative financing is what allowed me to do that. And I think two things that I tell everybody is the two things you should learn is creative financing and raising private money. Those two things alone can get you to where I'm at with a $50 million portfolio, just those two things. And I built my company off of those two things. So that's the two things I would say you should focus on. And it works today, right now. And this is the best time to learn creative financing because of how high interest rates are. That's the only way to make deals work and pencil out is knowing creative financing and how to structure deals. Yeah, um, I will echo, learn the hard way. You can never have enough private money yeah. ever, ever, ever. Like that is like, I've done a YouTube video on that, you know, cause as a novice, I had a cool 500K sitting on the sidelines. I thought, oh, that's more than enough money to get out there and make a dent and become a successful real estate investor. Like seven months later, all that money was used and I was like, crap, yeah. I was in your stance. I can't market anymore and I can't make payroll, but I have tons of equity once I can get these properties dispositioned. Yep. So yes, 
Um, definitely creative financing. I'm echoing. I mean, obviously he's the master, not me. I'm the novice saying, look, learn from me. I'm, I'm closest to where you're starting. He's where we all want to go. Alrighty. So speaking of where we want to go, how do we get a hold of you? How do we follow you? And how do we learn more about your coaching program? Yep. So we do a lot on IG, uh, Instagram. Uh, my handle's Alex period, the investor period, Quesada, Q U E Z A D A. And so that's the same on YouTube and TikTok, I think. And I love you, the fact that you said TikTok. I think so <laughs> I don't you have, don't you don't do your own TikTok. I, I don't do my own TikTok. I okay. don't have it on my phone. I don't want China on my phone. But <laughs> there's good content out there for you yes. via TikTok. And uh, we give a lot of uh, like we tour facilities. We do case studies on uh, self storage deals, houses we buy with creative financing, how to structure them. We li literally give a lot of info and education away on those platforms where you can go there and learn for free. And then if you want to kind of have more one on one intention, we have a group. Um, there's about 25, 26 guys in it right now, guys and girls, where they come to me to help with creative financing. It's called Creative Investor, where we the goal is to really get, I had a lot of wholesalers that I knew that I helped out get into wholesaling, and it's kind of really to get people, instead of just like what I did for six years, just wholesaling everything, to get them to say, we're in creative financing, it will help you in your wholesale business do more deals and more transactions and have more than one tool in your tool belt instead of just cash everything, cash offers. You can offer creative finance offers, but it also allow you to start buying assets, holding assets, and it also helps some people like go from single family to commercial assets, multifamily, uh, industrial, self-storage, and those things. So small group that we help people uh, kind of scale their business and start buying assets with creative financing. So alex.theinvestor.casada. Yep. Q-U-E-Z-A-D-A. -E Correct. That's Instagram, supposedly TikTok, and, and then you can look them up on YouTube yep. as well. To me, he's Alex Q. I'm Dio. You've just tuned in to the latest episode of the Loan Officer Podcast. That's all the time we have for you today, but we'll do it for to catch you on the next episode.